please welcome Peter Diamandis. Thank you, Ellen. Uh, so first of all, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's awesome to be back here again. Thank you to, to, to Jeff and Elliot and Ellen and the entire Summit community for allowing this conversation. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here. And I love this community's sense of, of action and participation. So uh, I want to talk about the world we're living into, but I want to talk about it from a perspective of a hopeful future. I want to talk about it from a perspective of the empowerment uh, that you have. So I think, and I hope at the end of this you'll agree, we're living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. And thank you for that, yes. And this is why, this is why. It used to be, if you wanted to solve a problem, the best you could do was go and petition the king or the queen or the pharaoh or you know, the overlord of your lands, the best you could do. And as the head of a nation, the best you could do was deploy your troops or change monetary policy. Today we're living in a day and age where any one of us who truly want to solve a problem can. I just want to, I want to let that sink in a little bit. We're more empowered as individuals than any time ever in human history. All of us have access to more capital than ever before. I mean, we're living in a time of all-time capital highs in every single sector. We're living in a time where we all have access to more computational power. I mean, literally, quantum computing capabilities on the cloud for free. I mean, how freaky can that be? So it's, do you want to solve the problem? Do you care? Do you have your mind and your heart enabled in such a way that you refuse to give up before the problem is solved? Because don't make some excuse that the money's not there, the technology's not there. It's there. It's are you, do you have the will and the heart and the mind and the perseverance? It might take you a decade, but it's not a matter of it can't be done. So that's the world that we're living in. And I want to give for the next 18 minutes, we can start this clock. I appreciate you guys holding on 50 minutes for me. That's awesome. It means I get a little bit extra. Uh, I, I want to start and give a little bit of overview of some of the technologies to start the conversation. Uh, but then we're going to get into a conversation around a little bit around the morals and ethics. All right. So here's another point that we're living in a time where I think none of us truly understand how fast the world is changing that the rate at which technology is getting faster is itself accelerating. And so this is the world today. Faster, cheaper computers are the oxygen in the room, the foundation that we're building on, and all these other technologies are progressing in speed and capability. They're reducing in price. They're increasing in reach. And it used to be that you could be an expert in any one of these sensors, networks, AI, robotics, 3D printing, synthetic biology, AR, VR, blockchain, all of these technologies you could build a business on, but now that's not enough. It's the combination of two, three, or four of these that are changing and building new business models. So I want to hit a few highlights of where we are, and then I'm going to sort of uh, uh, you know, toss up some of the conversation. So robots are coming in fast. Uh, this is Atlas. This is from Boston Dynamics. Uh, this is owned by Masasan SoftBank. Right, so this is the last, uh, last few months. This is Atlas Learning. This is not better mechanics or better motors or better materials. It's machine learning. It's AI being able to allow this robot to do what it needs to. Now, one of the challenges is will these robots, yeah, uh, <laughs> will these robots take our jobs? And they may take those jobs that are dirty, that are dull, that are dangerous, but these kinds of robots are also going to allow people to stay in their homes and not go into old nursing homes. People go into old nursing homes because they can't get out of bed or go to the bathroom by themselves or go and make their meals. But can robots give us the dignity to stay where we live and be assisted, right? In places like Japan, which doesn't have a replacement generation, and soon in China as well in the decades ahead, these kinds of robots will help provide the labor that's required. Now, if we can just bring the volume down to this a little bit, this is coming out of Google Brain. Um, and these robots are each experimenting, picking things up. And this is machine learning or neural networks in process. Every time a machine is able to go and pick something up successfully, that neural pathway is reinforced and says, yes, this works. When it doesn't work, it's, you know, 
not reinforced. And what these robots are demonstrating is that every time that one of those robots learns how to pick something up successfully, every robot learns. So it's like literally if you were in eighth grade learning algebra and, and the girl in the front row learned algebra first, then all 30 of you in the, in the classroom learned it at the same time, right? This is sort of shared learning at a, at a robot operating system. This is from Sundar, the CEO of, uh, of Google. He says, artificial intelligence could have more profound implications for humanity than electricity or fire. And I believe that's true. And it's this next decade, these next 20 years, Ray Kurzweil, my co-founder at Singularity, talks about the notion that by 2029, what is that, you know, 10 years from now, we're gonna have human level AI. The next year, AI is more advanced than humans. What is that going to mean? I wanna show you a short video so that you can see this and understand it. This is from, uh, this is from a, uh, a uh, division of Google called DeepMind. And this is DeepMind's program called AlphaGo Zero, uh, showing how advanced it is in gameplay. Now, AlphaGo won against Lee Sedol in uh, South Korean Go Champion a few years ago, and won in the game of Go. This is an AI winning the game of Go a whole decade ahead of before it was predicted. And then a year later, a new program called AlphaGo Zero blows away the old program of AlphaGo. Just listen, I want you to remember uh, the conversation that takes place with the guys who are running DeepMind. When we played against Lisa Doll, we actually had a system that had been trained on, on human data, on all of the millions of games that have been played by human experts. We eventually found a, a new algorithm, a much more elegant approach to the whole system. Instead of learning from human data, it learned from its own games, and that became a project which we called Alpha Zero. Zero meaning having zero human knowledge in the loop. The next stage was to make it more general so that it could play any two-player game, not just Go, but things like chess and Shogi, which is Japanese chess, and in fact, any kind of two-player perfect information game. What we discovered was that actually this exceeded all of our expectations. Alpha Zero could start in the morning playing completely randomly and then by tea would be a superhuman level, by dinner it would be the strongest chess entity there's ever been. After about eight or nine hours it was strong enough to be able to go out and defeat Stockfish, the incumbent world champion, a program which was vastly stronger than Deep Blue, the program which had previously defeated Kasparov. I love that quote, right? Start in the morning playing completely randomly and by tea be the, the strongest, you know, superhuman player that ever existed. And this is a program that has a set of rules and it plays within those rules and it is playing against itself. And every time a version of it advances, the next one plays against it and advances further. So the question is what else in our world is game? What else is gameplay? Is real estate gameplay? Is stock market gameplay? Is curing disease gameplay? Is getting the the right diagnostic uh, analysis of a chest x-ray or an MRI gameplay, they're all games in some way, shape, or form. And so AI is gonna enter our lives, and the question is, how are we going to deal with it? What are the, mor the morals, the ethics? We'll talk about that in our Q&A. One thing that is true today is that if you take an AI against an AI plus a human, the AI and human collaborative pair will always win. And so it's really, ultimately, how do we see AI as a tool that enables us to solve the world's biggest problems? I mean, we still have problems out there on the planet. And the matter is, how do you partner with these technologies to go and slay those problems to make the world a better place? As I teach in my abundance community and singularity, the world's biggest problems are the world's biggest business opportunities. Want to become a billionaire, help a billion people. These are the technologies that help you reach scale to help a billion people. Another technology that we'll talk about is the whole realm of CRISPR and gene therapy. So CRISPR is gene editing, being able to go in there and edit specifically a sequence or a particular nucleotide. All of us are made up of 3.2 billion letters, A, T, Cs, and Gs we got from our mom and from our dad, and in our genome is our medical future. Uh, Gene therapy is the ability to take a virus and use it as sort of a little robot to deliver into specific cells in your body, your liver cells, your kidney cells, your bone marrow cells, whatever it is, a particular snippet of, of a genome, a particular code, and insert it and replace it or add it in. And 
this is nothing short of extraordinary. The, the programming languages of the future is not going to be C++ or whatever it might be. It is going to be genetic code. So let's look at some of the headlines coming out of this just in this past year. Right? So it's CRISPR could be used to fight cancer. We have cancer trials going on right now. CRISPR uh, could correct 89% of genetic disease. So I'm incredibly amazed by the notion that we don't think of this, but genetic ailments from thalassemia, sickle cell anemia, whatever it might be, it's a coding error. And genetic you know, CRISPR technologies can cure potentially 89% of those. So one of the conversations we're going to have is ethically, it may be immoral not to treat your child, right? We're going to have a conversation where at some point, if we can cure all these diseases, is it ethically proper to let it occur or to say, no, we have to cure these diseases? Right, so what else we're seeing? We're seeing CRISPR can cure HIV and AIDS. We're seeing CRISPR can be used as the next antibiotic. We're seeing gene therapy could lead to anti-aging therapies, and gene therapy could also cure HIV and sickle cell. So this is extraordinary. We're going from evolution by natural selection, which is Darwinism, to evolution by human direction. And I think none of us understand how rapidly we're going to be evolving ourselves over the course of the decades ahead. And I'll, I'll hit this now, because I think it's really important to realize our ethics and our morals change over time. And it's important for us to look at these technologies and ask the question, is it moral or ethical to use it? In what context? I'll give you an example. Um, if I went back in history a thousand years ago to my great, 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 great grandfather in ancient Athens, for example, and said, listen, you've got this cardiomyopathy. You're going to die in the next year. This guy just died from being you know, gored by a, by a bull. And I'm going to take his heart out of him and put it into you. Right? A thousand years ago, that would have been the work of the devil. Today, it's a miracle. The same thing with in vitro fertilization and a multitude of things. So what is once immoral, unethical, the work of the devil may soon be something that is absolutely moral and ethical and must be done. And these are the conversations we need to have. And I think it's critically important. And I don't think these conversations are going on anywhere in any sufficient form. We're doing it at SU. We're doing it at XPRIZE. I'm sure it's happening. It is happening right here in this room here at Summit. Here's another area that's coming online. Uh, and this is how do we connect your brain to the cloud? So everything we've ever known, everything we've ever learned, every emotion, every concept is in the 100 billion neurons in our brain, which are connected with 100 trillion synaptic connections. And that brain of ours holds everything, our memories, our thoughts, our emotions. And it turns out that we can't grow more brain tissue. Our brains are landlocked by the size of the birth canal. Literally, that is a limiting factor in how big our brains can be. And our brains, a few million years ago, underwent these neural folds to increase the surface area of the neural cortex, to increase the amount, and our frontal lobes came into existence a couple of years, a couple of um, two million years ago for appreciation of concepts and, and empathy and art and other ideas. But the same way that you know, my cell phone, if it has a complex thing to do, it's not calculated on my phone. It goes from my phone out to the edge of the cloud, and the calculations occur there, and the answer comes back. So the question is, can we, in fact, connect our neocortex of our brain to the cloud? And there are a multitude of companies working on this. There is probably over a billion dollars a year going and being invested into connecting our brains to the cloud. If you think about it, the single most powerful thing that we could have for a country or a company or, you know, is intelligence of our, of our people. There's nothing more important than the intelligence of our employees and our people. And that's why in countries which have you know, uh, uh, dietary restrictions and micronutrient failures for pregnant moms and kids, that is a complete and total decimation of the intelligence of that nation because you don't get those IQ points back if your child is malnourished in utero in the early years. But what about increasing your memory and your computational power by being able to think and Google, by being able to 
you know, increase your cognitive capacity a thousandfold or a millionfold. So I don't know if any of you saw uh, when Elon and the team at Neuralink did an announcement about, about two and a half months ago, right? So Neuralink is in primates right now and plans to be in humans at the end of 2020, you know, a year from now, extraordinary, in being able to connect using their Neuralink chips into the neocortex of the brain and being able to give you the ability to sense at a distance or manipulate motors, controls at a distance. So originally what they're gonna do this for is people who've got a, a cervical break, they're locked in, they can't move, they can't feel, they can't speak, they can't do anything. But imagine if you could bypass all of the normal pathways and go straight to the brain, go to the homunculus of the sensory or motor cortex of your brain and be able to get sensory information directly in and being able to say, I wanna control that robotic arm to pick up an apple and feed me whatever it might be. Now, the numbers, if you do the calculations, their expectation is that they'll be able to, to do two gigabits per second of connectivity from the neocortex to the cloud. And that's just the beginning. So Ray Kurzweil uh, talks about this concept of brain-computer interface. And his prediction was not 2045, which was a number of conversations. His prediction is that by 2035, we're gonna be connecting your neocortex to the cloud. So what's it like when you can know anything? Where if you're connected and I'm connected, I can know your thoughts and feelings and emotions. Is it gonna make us more empathic to each other? Is it gonna say, hey, listen, I want you to succeed. When you succeed, I succeed because we're all part of the same meta intelligence, right? Do we think about the fact that we are all a collection of 30 to 50 trillion cells that make us human? Right? You're not a single living organism, you're 30 trillion organisms working together collaboratively. And so I think these kinds of technologies of BCI are gonna create a, a collection of eight billion people. I'm a huge Star Trek fan. My only problem with the Roddenberry universe is they made the Borg evil. If they'd made the Borg friendly, that would've been much better. But so how, when we connect and I can, I can see a sunrise through the eyes of someone in Japan, or I can feel the pain, or I can share my thoughts and my feelings with individuals. Is that a world that's gonna be more peaceful? I think it is. I think it's a world that's more, that's more you know, awake. And we talk about doing this through plant medicine, we talk about doing through meditation. There's a technological solution as well that is coming online. We'll see where it goes. All right, we're seeing increasing abundance as well. These are the charts from the World Bank. And you can see over the last few years is continued movement. We're taking more and more people out of extreme poverty and moving them into middle class or to poverty into middle class. Let's also talk about that these technologies are enabling small teams to solve huge problems. I'm very proud of the work that my team does at the XPRIZE Foundation. This was our first XPRIZE, a $10 million prize for a private space flight. Uh, 26 teams spent, ten, spent $100 million going after that $10 million prize and the winning technology, Spaceship One, is hanging in the Smithsonian, and of course, Virgin Galactic just announced it's, going, it's gone public, and of course, we're now focusing on what other problems in the world do we wanna solve? So I serve as executive chairman, I have an amazing, amazing woman as CEO, Anusha Ansari, who funded our first X Prize. She had just exited for $1.3 billion, was a passion about space, grew up in Tehran, dreaming about space flight, and when I approached her to fund the first $10 million prize, she and Amir and Hamid say yes. We have awarded or launched about $200 million of prizes thus far. Another $200 million are under development. Let me give you a quick overview because these are the kinds of things that are enabling small teams powered by these technologies to solve problems. So we had this $15 million prize funded by Elon Musk to build software that could teach a child in the middle of no place reading, writing, and numeracy on their own. We did the experiment with 2,500 kids in Tanzania, in the bush where there was nothing. Uh, Sundar gave us 5,000 tablets, Android tablets. We ran the competition. $300 million spent by all the teams to win this $15 million prize. The winning software, one hour of tablet use a day, was the equivalent of that kid being in full-time school down in, in, uh, in the capital of Tanzania. I love this prize. This is an X prize for mapping the ocean floor. The estimate was 300 years to map the ocean floor at 4,000 meters depth. 
the winning technology took it from 300 years down to 10 years' time. Right? This is an XPRIZE that was won two years ago called the Water Abundance XPRIZE. We, we talk about water wars and water scarcity. We fight over half a percent of the water on the planet in the rivers and the lakes. But it turns out there are quadrillions of liters in the atmosphere and the biosphere. And so this was an XPRIZE challenging teams to pull the water out of the atmosphere for two cents per liter, a thousand liters from day, per day for all renewable energy source. And that was won, again, about 18 months ago. So where are we going next? The environment is calling loud and clear. Uh, so where are we? We have a rainforest XPRIZE we're about to announce. Can you, can you measure the biodiversity in an acre of rainforest? So you value the rainforest not for timber or not for plantable land, but by the biodiversity. You can't, you can't impact what you can't measure. And you can't value what you can't measure. This is an XPRIZE, thank you for that. This is an XPRIZE that we're getting ready to launch uh, very shortly, being funded out of uh, Abu Dhabi. This is an XPRIZE for cellular agriculture. Can we grow steaks that are healthier, cheaper, and better for you from stem cells in downtown Nairobi, downtown LA, wherever it might be, right? So that we stop decimating the planet by just literally one-third of the non-ice landmass of planet Earth is for livestock. And as people become more abundant financially, they all want higher versions of protein. We can't continue to do that. We have to reinvent how we take sunlight and produce it into protein molecules that we consume. This is one of those ways. I'm super excited about this prize. Uh, we are decimating and acidifying our oceans and the coral reefs. And so this is a coral restoration X prize. This is a prize we're looking for a sponsor for, if you know anybody who wants to do this. Uh, so this is for rapid restoration. Can we replant coral reefs 10 times faster than we're losing them, 100 times faster than we're losing them? Uh, this is another X prize that we're working on, and this is can we demonstrate super low cost, scalable CO2 removal uh, of you know, 10 gigatons by 2050? This is a, our largest prize. I love this prize. There are three trillion trees on planet Earth. If we could plant an additional trillion trees, we could bring back the CO2 levels of our atmosphere to pre-industrial age. So this is, can we design the technology for rapid plantation and rapid growth of trees to get a trillion trees in a decade's time? One personally uh, important to me, and this drives me nuts, we haven't reinvented how we fight wildfires in decades. So here's my thesis. I believe it should be possible to detect the wildfire at the moment it starts. If it's bigger than two meters or if it's moving, put it out minutes later. Stop waiting for it to become this raging forest fire. Put it out at the very inception. So this is one that we have uh, two amazing people, um, Dick Merkin, Dr. Dick Merkin and, and Scott Painter, who've underwritten the beginning of this. We're looking to raise the capital to launch this prize. I think this being you know, really uh, you know, terrorized by wildfires is insane. Let's actually reinvent how we detect them and put them out 10 minutes later. So, I'll close on a couple of thoughts, we'll go to Q&A. The first is a negative mind will never give you a positive life, right? This is an amazing time to be alive. The second is that we are, you know, the world's biggest problems, the world's biggest business opportunities, and as I said in the very beginning, we're living during the most extraordinary time ever in human history. If you'd like these slides, if you send an email to slides at diamandis.com, my server will send you back a stack of slides. So if we could get the lights up a little bit, I'd love to have a conversation. We have 30 minutes for Q&A. Thank you. <laughs> oh yeah, we, uh, mic stanchions here, uh, or... So people can line up at either the mics, and there are a few things to keep in mind for your questions. Don't introduce yourself. One sentence for your question. No follow-up questions. And keep your mouth close to the mic so that everybody can hear you. And this is the fun part. So the morals, the ethics, the challenges, where we're going, what we should be doing, who should be thinking about it. Please, let's start over here. Yeah. OK. Um, my first question is, or I guess my only question is, uh, do you see technologies like Neuralink um, causing acceleration economic disparity? 
of economic disparity? Dispa yes, sir. Great question. So let me, let me discuss this concept of the rich-poor gap. I think it's a really important conversation to be had because I want to reframe how we think about this. For all of human history, there was the king and the queen on the hilltop and everyone else in abject squalor, right? You're with me there. Yes, that was the way it was. And we're heading towards a world where it was, it used to be the have and the have nots. And we're heading towards a world of haves and super haves. My mission at the X Prize at Singularity and Abundance 360 and all that I do is how do we uplift everybody to a world where every man, woman, and child has access to everything they need. Yes, the wealth gap will increase. But as long as the floor has reached a level where people have a life of potential, not a life of luxury, but life of potential, I'm okay with that. So please think about the rich-poor gap as not being the most relevant thing. It's where is the floor? Does that make sense? Thank you. Please. Thanks. Uh, I'm curious what you think about the application of AI to art, music, and particularly visual art. What's possible, what we might see in our lifetimes, and the ethics behind it? Thank you. Uh, uh, great question. So one of the conversations I have with audiences all the time is, you know, do you believe so, I mean, actually, can we get lights up even a little bit more? Is that possible? I, I want to take a little poll. How many folks here believe that AI, AI artists will be as good as and indistinguishable from human artists? Can I see your hands go up? Okay, that is the, that, that's actually a higher majority than I normally get. How many folks here think that AIs will be writing incredible uh, novels and feature films that you didn't know was human or AI? Raise your hands, please. So one of the things I think about is we're going to discover what is truly human. In the next 20 years, we're going to find out what is it that a human can do that an AI cannot do. And that's going to be an interesting conversation, to say the least. Uh, but I do believe we're going to head towards a point in which AIs are creating music and art and story and creative and humor that are... Uh, as good or better than humans. Now the question is again, is it gonna be an AI-human collaboration? I'm not passing judgment on this. I just think that that is going to happen and maybe it's gonna be, um, maybe people will value the AI, the human created element more. But I think if we, if we don't see that this is a potential and we fool ourselves, I mean, one of the things I think about importantly is a different part, which is the application of medicine that I think there will be a time, for example, where it is immoral or it is, um, uh, it is illegal not to have an AI do the diagnostic. That it is, uh, uh, what do you call it? Um, it's uh, malpractice if you don't have an AI actually do the diagnostic on the MRI or the pathology slide because it is able to do it at a higher level than a human. These are the kinds of conversations we're gonna, we're gonna need to interpret. We'll find out. Obviously, I don't know the answers, but please. Yeah, I'm really curious to hear how you think some of these technologies could address mental health issues. So I think men, uh, the brain is one of the great uh, frontiers that we have this next decade. Mm -hmm. And uh, we are just beginning to understand how we read and how we measure and how we understand how the brain uh, works and operates, the neurochemistry, the physiology of the brain. And so I think one, we're going to learn a lot. Second, we're going to be able to use these technologies to catch mental health issues much earlier than ever before. Mm -hmm. So we're all going to eventually have a version of Jarvis from Iron Man. You remember Jarvis from Iron Man, that AI software shell that, that he has? And we're seeing that with early versions of Alexa and Google Home and so forth, that it's listening and so imagine if it's able to detect challenges and problems for individuals early at the beginning and get them help when they need it. Um, are we gonna start to, so it's early detection, are we gonna start to understand the neurochemistry and understand the physiology of how we support it? Um, I think that the, like I said, there's nothing more valuable for a country or a company or a, a group than than some element of human intelligence, which can include empathy and, and all the versions of intelligence that exist. Mm -hmm. So I think that we're, we're at a, just at the beginning of the inflection point of understanding brain science. And so I would just leave it, at, I would leave it at that for now, but thank you. Yeah, thank you. Please. 
Thank you for uh, the very helpful um, lecture. I, I also want to point out, in addition to all the positive trends you've uh, mentioned, that there are many negative trends that are accelerating also exponentially, including population growth, energy and resource consumption, and importantly, CO2 consumption. And so what we fundamentally have is a temporal issue between the acceleration of the positive and then the impact of the negative. And I wanted to ask your thoughts on those two lines. And how great. So thank you for that. So let's let's jump into that. The first I saw about population. Do you know there's great two two great TED talks by Bill Gates on population. You know the two things that reduce population growth rate pressures. What are they? Education and health. You make a city, a country healthier and better educated. The number of children per family rapidly decrease. I know these numbers. I've looked at them. The, the replacement rate for a nation is 2.1 children per family, okay? Globally, we used to be at an average of around five to six children per family. We're massively reducing over the last 50 years. We're about 2.42 children per family today. In the United States, we're at 1.7 something. We're below the replacement rate, right? So the challenge in the future may not be overpopulation of planet Earth, it may well be underpopulation of planet Earth, that we will peak at nine, nine and a half billion, do uh, billion dollars, billion people, and have a very rapid decrease after that. Energy, one of the things that gives me a great amount of hope is that we are bathed in a squanderable abundance of energy. We're bathed in 6,000 times more energy from the sun than we consume as a species in a year. And if you look at the rate at which we are, um, so energy is not scarce, it's just not in a usable form yet. And if you think about it, we used to go and kill whales on the, on the ocean to get whale oil to light our nights. Right? That was an energy source. Then we ravaged mountainsides. Then we started drilling kilometers underground and then fracking. But the potential for solar and for renewables is extraordinary. The numbers are extraordinary, too. Um, last year, we were at, uh, at 2.1 cents and then 2 cents per kilowatt hour without subsidies in Mexico today, in Brazil, we're at 1.75 cents per kilowatt hour. We'll be, low, we'll be below a penny per kilowatt hour from solar within the next decade. And then we have amazing breakthroughs on storage that are going on right now. So I believe that we're heading towards an energy revolution that will unfortunately destabilize Venezuela and Russia and parts of the Middle East. But we're heading towards a period of squanderable abundance of energy. And if you think about it, the world's poorest countries on the planet or the world's sunniest countries on the planet. Now, CO2, yes, it's not a climate, it's, it's not a, a problem, it's a, it is a crisis, right? And it is a crisis that we now have better and better tools to solve. We heard about quantum supremacy from Google last month. One of the most valuable things that quantum computers are gonna give us is the ability for new material sciences. Perhaps it's, you know, how do we better extract CO2 from the atmosphere? Again, the tools we have to solve problems are themselves getting better and better. And that, you know, and I would rather count on entrepreneurs to solve these problems empowered by these tools than governments. So I'll leave it on, on that thought, please. Hi, hey there. I lost my voice by talking so much this weekend. Um, how do you think about accountability and responsibility systems uh, for technology like Neuralink? Yeah, so uh, that is a, a really important question. And the question is, do we, as citizens of whatever nation, do you depend on your government to make it happen, right? So I remember when I was at MIT, I was doing my molecular genetics degree, and it was at a time when recombinant DNA, the earliest versions of slicing and dicing DNA uh, was happening. And there was a large amount of deliberation and discussion about, is it ethically moral? Are we gonna have, you know, Clone babies, Hitler Youth, all of the all of the negative ex concepts were coming out of that, and there was a series of conferences that were uh, called the Asilomar conferences, that all of the gene jockeys, all the genetic engineers went to, and they they created a set of self regulations, right? They didn't depend on. I mean, honestly, I, I have a hard time believing that our Congress or Senate is going to make up a set of rules that I'm gonna believe is safe for the future of this stuff. I don't know about you guys, I, um, I would rather have, you know, sort of a, that kind of an Asilomar conference event of scientists coming together uh, and, and with the right theologians and ethicists and so forth and creating a set of rules. 
Here's the challenge, and here's the challenge for all of us. The rate at which these technologies are, are, accelerating, are accelerating themselves. And it used to be that there was enough time to adapt to these. The biggest concern I have is that the rate of adaptation is much slower. And what are governments? Governments are stabilization factors. Religious institutions are stabilization factors. None of us want to wake up in the morning and think that the world is different from last night. We like having things not change as much as we might think about that, of wanting change. And so it is a challenge. And the con these kinds of conversations are not going on enough. That's why, I mean, for me, I'm on the stage like, this is happening. This is not a matter of if or and or when, it's happening. I remember I was, uh, I, we have an exponential families program at Singularity, and it was um, successful families with their next generation or third generation. And this, this young man uh, who was about 19 asked me, he said, you know, Peter, is, is faster change better? Why should we have it this way? And I said, it's not if it's better or if we should. It is happening whether we like it or not. It's how do we think about uh, adapting to it, using it. How do we, how do we, what are we measuring and how are we surfacing these things? And so those are you know, super important conversations and they're not happening anywhere near enough. Thank you, please. Uh, so you briefly touched on the subject of plant medicine and I've been really fascinated with uh, this reframe on AI. So instead of artificial intelligence, ancient intelligence, mm -hmm. really looking at uh, the, the ancient wisdom of the earth itself, the consciousness of the earth, and how we can use these plants as sort of an umbilical cord that connects our consciousness to that, that plugs us back in, right? And, and into our AI, essentially our innate intelligence. To what degree uh, is, is that resource of information being used in the exploration of, uh, you know, machine learning and everything you're talking about? So, let me answer a slightly different question because I don't have an answer to what you're, what you're asking. But I do think that as we are, I mean, when I, see, when I see plant medicine that I have used and that I have experienced, it's about dissolution of the ego. Mm -hmm. It's about connecting yourself to the world and understanding your role and position and the connection. And so uh, I, I think that there are two separate issues, but if our leaders and our entrepreneurs are able to be driven by a higher level of, of desire and concern and connectedness versus ego and wealth creation, that's a better world to be in. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm not sure, I, I do like ancient intelligence. That's a great, com it's a, it's a, great, uh, uh, a great name for it, but thank you. Please. Hi. Uh, so many of the X prizes focus on sort of finding a fundamental technological breakthrough to solve a problem, which is absolutely necessary. Uh, but there's many cases where we already have a solution to a problem and we just lack the ability to implement that solution to that problem. Our political systems, our bureaucratic systems don't facilitate that. Have you looked at creating sort of like a meta level prize that focuses on actual like implementation breakthroughs yeah. or like patterns of like political like uh, solution making? So great point, and you're 100% correct. A lot of times it's not just making the widget, it is the implementation of the widget into the world and having it actually solve the problem. And so we've changed a lot of the work that we're doing at the XPRIZE to, uh, we say when a prize gets won, it's the beginning, right, of how do we actually drive implementation into the world. So for example, that Global Learning XPRIZE, the software that, uh, the competition that Elon funded that we had in Tanzania, that software, as powerful as it is, was in Swahili alone. So we're now working with philanthropists around the world to recode it into Hindi and Spanish and multitude of languages and getting it out there. It's open source now in the world. But our mission is, is uh, you know, setting a very clear, measurable, objective goal, inspiring entrepreneurs, and now you know, getting it out there into the world. So we have a lot of work to do there, but it is very much our, our focus. But you're spot on in terms of don't build a widget just to have a widget exist. It's how do you actually solve the world's problems? Yeah, thank you. Hi, uh, how will humans adapt to a coming technological singularity to ensure that we're not left behind by AI? Yeah, so let me interpret your question here. 
Uh, the technological singularity as it's defined is a moment in time where the speed of technology is happening so fast that we poor humans can't keep up with it. And, and we can't. I mean, if you think about the notion that we have something called cognitive biases, our brain cannot, cannot actually uh, process all the information we have coming in, right? So we take these shortcuts. Our shortcuts mean we have a recency bias. We tend to believe knowledge that we just learned more than knowledge we knew in the past. We have a negativity bias. We tend to give greater credence to negative information, or we have a familiarity bias. We tend to give value to uh, someone stated by someone who looks like us versus different. And these biases are for us to be able to process information. And, you know, I think the only way that we as humans end up um, uh, living in this world is by merging with that world. Uh, it really is. It's what, you know, uh, what Elon and many others speak about, uh, I do as well, is how do we actually become um, uh, merged with. So I'll give you an analogy. It's a, for me, it's a beautiful analogy of life on this planet Earth. Four billion years ago, when life first began, it began as what's called prokaryotic life forms, very simple life forms, cellular bag of cytoplasm and some free-floating DNA. That life then became complex life forms, eukaryotic life forms, incorporating mitochondria and nuclear membranes and endoplasmic reticulum and technology for processing information and processing um, uh, energy better. And then we became multicellular life forms and then eventually tissues and organs and all of us here, 30 trillion cells collaborating together. But it was one of increasing complexity and collaboration. And so the Potential is for us to, you know, we are in the midst of, does anybody here not have their cell phone with them? I'm curious. Anybody? Anybody? Nobody. Okay, so this is, I mean, this is part of you, right? I, I'll go 50,000 people without having someone not have their cell phone. And I remember last time I said, where is it? And they said, I lost in the Uber that morning. Uh, <laughs> so this is, this is becoming incorporated into us. Right, uh, we're, we're in the next decade, uh, implantables and wearables and all of that, we're merging with technology. And, and you can choose not to, right? This is not, no one's forcing you to have access to these technologies, to use email, to use FaceTime, to use all of these capabilities. It makes our lives better in some way, but the world's gonna become automatic and magical. I call it sort of an automagical world around us. And we're going to, um, co-evolve, we're going to evolve into the next level of what it means to be human. Here's the key point. I don't think this is 100 years from now or 50 years from now or 40 years from now. I think it's the next 30 years. We're in the highest level of the game right now. Uh, the rate, you know, if we truly have human level AI in 10 years, and Ray's got like an 87% accuracy rate on his predictions, so let's say it's off by a few years. So we have brain computer interface and BCI at high bandwidth in 15 years. Hell, the, the iPhone is only you know, 12 years ago. So what's it like when we are connected at the neocortex level with AI and with each other and where we have all the energy we want and we're able to genetically engineer and so forth, all of these things, the world's gonna be changing, not just slightly. We're reinventing what it means to be human. And the most important thing for me is it needs to be done with intention. It needs to be done with a vision of where we're going. It needs to be done with a, uh, with a, a heart and a soul and not just randomly. So these are the conversations. And you may say it's bullshit. I don't agree. It's not going to be happening. You're way too optimistic. You're a techno-utopian. I don't care. At the end of the day, these technologies are moving faster and faster and more and more capable. And we're heading towards a world of where we used to have half the world connected, 3.7 billion people were connected digitally two years ago. In the next six years, we're about to connect 8 billion people. Four billion new minds are coming online in the next six years, right? From Starlink and 5G and OneWeb and Coupier and Google Loon, all these things are connecting everybody. Not like I came online at 9600 bought an AOL. Right? They're all coming online at gigabit connection speeds with access to AI and quantum computing on the cloud. If you thought things were slowing down, they're about to kick into high gear as more people start inventing and desiring and commuting and, and all these things. 
So these are the conversations that we need to be having. Thank you. Hey, Jim. Hey, hey Peter. Hey, Jim. Yeah. Do you think uh, humans or AI will be the first to unravel the deep code of human consciousness? Yeah. And what is the implications for artificial comp consciousness? <clears throat> you want me to give you the answer? <laughs> <laughs> yes. I think you think I'm in too much, my friend. <laughs> so listen, I, I have no friggin' idea, right? <laughs> you know, a after you do you know, 5DMT, your entire vision of consciousness changes. <laughs> So, so we need to give the AI some plant medicine then? Yeah, we'll find out. But uh, I, it just, I find it fascinating. I mean, guys, we are so lucky to be alive now, right? I, I, want you to be, I want you to be imbued by the sense of like awe and inspiration and empowerment of the time that we're alive, that we can start to have these kinds of conversations. Even ask that question is insane. Right? Yeah, sure. And to be able to say, to believe that there could be an answer, and there will be. What is consciousness? Will there be artificial consciousness? Will I merge with consciousness? Right? There are conversations going on right now for a head transplant. Right? I mean, literally, there are being planned head transplants in animals, and then there will one be in human, and is that person, you know, I don't know. Right. I mean, these are amazing things. And so, you know, the question you should ask me is, are we living in a virtual existence? Is this real, or is this is this is this an entire, you know, virtual existence? Then we'll then we'll start talking. <laughs> Please. Hi, Peter. So I want to talk about diversity, and you know, thinking about the future of germline gene editing, where parents have the ability yes, to shift, great. and the 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 brain computer interface. How are we going to ensure all together working? that these technologies bring about and preserve the sense of diversity that's been the main survival series, the strategy of our species? So that's a really critically important question. So first of all, um, I just want to hit on a couple of things. I want us all to remember when we are looking at these questions, how quickly the world has changed and how far we have come in such a short time, right? A hundred years ago, depending on where you were born, determined everything in your life, right? The language you spoke, whether your village had a school, whether you're a woman, you know, what color or creed you were, determined everything in your life. And you were stuck. 100 years ago, not that long ago, 100 years ago, you were stuck. And today, we're heading towards a world of potential, where independent of all that, there is something you could do, some place you could go to really become fully who you are. And it's a beautiful thing. Now, are we going to, if we become this meta-intelligence, if we're connected, what happens to my individuality? Are we part of the Borg, the collective, and so forth? I don't know. I don't know. I do believe I can imagine a world in which if I plug into this meta-intelligence, which is the world I call it, I close my next book, The Future's Fast, and you think on this exact conversation. If I plug in and all of a sudden I'm able to know the thoughts and the feelings and the knowledge of the world, and I feel so connected to everybody, Right? where it's not you or me, we are one, and your success is my success. Right? That's such a sense of beautiful connection. If I ever unplugged from that, I would feel so lonely. Right? So there's an interesting alternate view. All of these things, all these moral and ethical conversations have flipped views. Right? Do you do gene editing to your child's germline, to your germline? Is that moral or ethical? There may be a point in the future where it is immoral and unethical not to do that. How could you not have corrected these genetic ailments that your child has? How immoral are you? How unethical are you as a parent to not do that? You know, we all are doing this kind of genetic selection when we pick our spouse, right? On, you know, are they beautiful? Are they handsome? Are they smart? Are they wealthy? Are they intelligent? And so forth. You know, you do it when you, when you send your kid to the best school or get the best clothing or the best books or the best tutors. Why do you not want to consider starting with the best genetics? Oh my God, you can't do that. But these things change over time. But these are the conversations we need to be having for sure. Thank you. Please. 
Hi, Peter. Uh, are there any AI systems in existence or under development that have the ability to counterbalance logic and efficiency uh, with ethical and moral so considerations? I, so that's a great conversation. I think about, remember I said we're all gonna have a version of Jarvis, an AI software shell, that you're gonna give permission to read your emails, listen to your conversations, look at your blood, you know, blood markers, because that AI makes your life better and, and automagical, right? That AI, so, I think you, there'll be a time in which your AI is able to, you're able to say, listen, can you tell me if I'm being biased? Can you tell me if I'm not seeing all the data? Because we can't, we just have such a limited IO capability. There's no way we can possibly look at all the point of views. We have Dunbar's number, right, of 150 people that are in our inner earth circle. And those 150 people is, again, these are cognitive biases and limitations. AIs don't have that. Will we have a world in which you say, listen, um, I want to swap out those 150 people depending on where I am. I want the 150 people I know here to be in my Dunbar's number. And I want that you know, to be sort of shape-shifted depending on where I am. So I feel ethically or I feel empathic to you and better connected to you. But I think that we're going to merge with AI in one shape, form, or another. Uh, and the question is, do we... Do we allow that to make us more empathic, right? Do we allow that to, um, to make us uh, see the other side of the conversation? Uh, do we allow that to help us cut the bullshit from reality in terms of actual science? The whole conversation around fake news, right? Uh, I don't think that's gonna be solved by, by humans. I think that's gonna have to be solved by algorithms. Uh, and it's going to be a constant white hat, black hat battle. But again, these are the conversations are not happening enough. I don't know if, if you're having the conversations. Uh, please do. Um, but thank you for that. Thank you. Given the changes in connectivity you're talking about and these solutions in the next 20 or 30 years, let's go 50 years in the future. What's the future of desire? So... Um, are we all going to become Waldo sitting on a couch, you mean, in that regard? Or? Just if everything's taken care of, there's no disease. I can yeah. take so, the knowledge from everyone. There's no difference. What's my desire? Yeah, so, it's a, so again, I want to put us in context today. For all of human history, our mission was survival. It was fucking survival, right? It was like, I have no food. My, there's a plague. Right? This was the reality of 500 years ago, 1,000 years ago. It's Homo sapiens. A caveman was 100,000 years ago. Right? It's, not, it's a pretty recent time. We, had, we lived to survive. That was, sur I mean, dude, that was life. It was, we were dying, you know, the average lifespan was early 30s. And then 100 years ago, it grew to like, you know, 40. That was a big deal. And so it's just now that we can have these conversations about purpose and mission and what I want to do and what do I desire. And so maybe these technologies and capabilities allow us to have greater dreams to go and, and do what we want to do. Or maybe it's about taking a break from survival and having some joy and happiness. Uh, I don't know, but I would rather not have it be about continuous survival. Now I can apply my mind, your mind, our treasures, our tech and whatever to solving more and more problems. My mission is to help everybody understand how powerful we are to solve problems, right? The world's biggest problem is the world's biggest business opportunity. See a problem, go and solve a problem. Stop complaining about problems, solve the problems. So if that's a level of consciousness that we can get to, um, that's my hope. Um, thanks. What makes you so confident in your view rather than the catastrophic risk view where genetically engineered pandemics, nuclear proliferation, environmental destruction, cyber warfare? Yeah. Fair question. Um, and I won't joke about it. Uh, we, first of all, where'd you, where'd you go? There you go. Uh, we, uh, we've survived thus far. And if you look at the data, the world on almost every single level has been getting better and better in a multitude of ways. The empowerment of the individual to find a problem and solve a problem is increasing. Uh, I believe, and I'm curious how you feel, that on the whole, 
humans are good. And it's that, that bent between people being good and desiring to make the world a better place versus the black hats in the world, that that tilt is what enables us to do better. We're also heading towards a world of radical transparency, a world where doing stuff and hiding is harder and harder and harder. Right? So you point a TV camera at a despot and they stop abusing women and children. You put cameras on a dashboard of a, of a, of a police car and there are consequences if they do something. One of the foundations I've supported in the past, the Lindbergh Foundation, will fly drones over packs of elephants and rhinoceroses, and when the drones are watching, the poachers stay away. And so we're heading towards a world of, by 2020, next year, uh, 20 billion connected devices, a trillion sensors. Right? So what do I mean by trillion sensors? Thousands of satellites imaging, millions of drones imaging, Every autonomous car with a LIDAR is generating 750 megabytes of data per second as it's going down the road looking at it, forward-looking augmented reality glasses. Everything is being imaged and seen all the time. And so in that world, I have to teach my two eight-year-old boys, you know, be careful what you do, what you say, or what you, what you post because it's there for the rest of your life. All right? Thank God it wasn't that way when I was a kid. <laughs> but... So that radical transparency, I think people behave differently when they're being watched. And that also gives me a great deal of hope. So it's empowerment of the individual to solve and, and fix problem, and this sense of radical transparency. Oops, we're out of time, aren't we? Yeah, sorry. Okay, take the last question and we'll go. Thank you. Um, you mentioned the, um, you, you know, you, you, you mentioned people and uh, um, changing your behavior when you're being watched as we can see by our president, right? Sometimes that isn't always effective, right? Watching somebody and calling them out for their behavior sometimes doesn't change it. So we mentioned also government regulation and trusting entrepreneurs instead of governments. Um, once you recognize bad behavior, right? Non-altruistic behavior, doesn't government give us the authority to then go and change that? Isn't government kind of an error correction for human behavior? It's supposed to be. So I think that uh, we're heading towards a world of more and more individual empowerment uh, and, and connectedness. Uh, I think, again, it used to be that we lived in a world where the nation state controlled the gas line, the one TV station, the electricity, and you were screwed. We're heading towards a world of massive dematerialization, demonetization, and democratization, and empowerment of individuals. Uh, and that's a world that I feel much greater hope for, right? Democracy was designed for a very different world. It was designed for a representative democracy where the, where the Pony Express was the means of transportation. We're going to probably, hopefully, begin to see experimentation in governance systems, uh, probably in virtual worlds and virtual communities, and then eventually off-world. But again, I will close on this, one, on this one thought, which is probably the single most important thing for me, which is we're living in a day and age where instead of complaining about problems, we are more empowered ever before to solve them. The tools that we have, the capital we have, the data that we have, the connections that we have are extraordinary. I wish you an amazing rest of the day. Thank you all very much. Ladies and, gentle, ladies and gentlemen, Peter Diamantes. Ladies and gentlemen, fantastic. Thank you. Thank you, guys.